We're in chapter 2, and uh, I'll begin reading here in Habakkuk chapter 2 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 4, and we'll get into our study. Habakkuk chapter 2, beginning at verse 1 and reading to verse 4. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am reproved. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now, I want you to notice as we begin here in chapter 2 how Habakkuk begins by simply saying, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch and see. Now, in order to remind you of what we've seen already and to lead into chapter 2, I would remind you that Habakkuk is a prophet of God who prophesied in the days preceding what is called the Babylonian captivity. And as we saw when we looked at chapter 1, he was a, a man of God frustrated as he watched his people continue in sin without any sense of remorse whatsoever. And like righteous Lot, his righteous soul was tormented as he saw their unrighteousness daily. And because of this, Habakkuk cried out to God and he asked him how long it would take until God moved in judgment. I mentioned to you that his name Habakkuk means to embrace or literally to wrestle. And in chapter 1, we saw that he was actually wrestling with God. He was wrestling with the Lord and he was asking him, how long will iniquity, how long will trouble, how long will plundering and violence and strife, how long will contention and injustice continue? He was asking him, when are you going to move and deal with all of this sin? It reminds me of what the psalmist says in Psalm 94, verse 3, when the psalmist said, Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? And so that's what Habakkuk was doing in chapter 1. He was wrestling and he was asking the Lord, how long is it going to be until you move with judgment? Now I believe that we, even in our day, can sometimes cry out to the Lord in frustration because we can see so often sin that seems to go unpunished. And sometimes we can cry out. I think that some of you probably have cried out, even as I have, when I've seen little girls who have been abducted or little boys being molested, and I say, God, how long until something is done to stop this? How many times are kids going to go working in their fast food restaurant and they're going to be murdered for $50? Lord, I cry out sometimes, how long is it going to be until you move when people can't even go to their job at a bank? They can't even go in to make a deposit or a withdrawal without being murdered. And sometimes we can cry that out and we can actually be frustrated. We can say, Lord, how long until you move? And Habakkuk was frustrated. He was frustrated with how the Lord's allowing him to see wickedness, but doesn't seem to be moving and doing anything. So he cries out and he says, how long are you going to allow me to see injustice and you don't move? But notice with me that as we went through chapter one, God answered him. And God was basically saying to him, Habakkuk, I am moving. I'm moving behind the scenes. He was basically saying, my invisible hand is at work. I'm fulfilling my word. You just don't understand this at the moment. I've already said what I'm going to do to this nation that rejects me. I've already told them that the Babylonians are going to come and take them captive. In Jeremiah, he says in chapter 25, verse 11, the whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. These nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. I've already told you that this is going to take place. I've already said it. I've said it before. I said it through other prophets. I said it through Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 39, verses 6 and 7, when I was speaking to Hezekiah the king, and I said, The days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget. They shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And he's saying, I've already said that something is going to take place. I've already said that they're going to go into captivity. So immediately as he's speaking, Habakkuk began to reel. And he began to ask the Lord, as we saw in chapter 1 once again, how is it that you're going to use a nation to chastise us that is even more wicked than we are? They are gross idolaters who give glory to their own power and their own war machines. 
Are you going to allow them to claim a victory over your people by, and by association, are you going to allow them to claim a victory over you? And as we were looking at this chapter, we concluded in chapter 1 with Habakkuk awaiting an answer from God. He'd cried out to God with some very troubling questions, and God was not swift to answer. So the first chapter could be a word, one word, wrestling. The second chapter opens with one word, and that is waiting. So we see that he wrestles, and now as we open chapter 2, we see that he is waiting. Notice in verse 1 again when he says, I will stand my watch, set myself on the rampart, and watch to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer. And I want you to see this. And what I will answer when I am reproved, when I am corrected, when God spanks me, basically is what he's saying. Now this is where we find him. He's placed himself on a watchtower on the wall of Jerusalem. Notice the scripture tells us that he's standing watch. He's looking into the distance and he's waiting for the Lord to answer him. Now, his being on this wall carries great significance because remember, he's a prophet. And as a prophet, he had the responsibility to cry out warnings to the people. The watchman on the watchtower had the responsibility, if he saw the enemy approaching, he had the responsibility to cry out a warning to tell the people the enemy is coming. You see this in Ezekiel, for example, in chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. In the book of Ezekiel, another prophetic book, Ezekiel says this. He says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. See, the watchman has the responsibility to cry out. And so say that you cry out a warning. Say you're a watch person, a watchman, a watch woman, if you will, and you're crying out a warning, but people ignore you. You deliver your soul because you gave to them the warning, but they rejected it. Now, if they listen to you and they're saved, you did your job and you're rewarded for it. But if you see something coming and you're too busy running yourself to, to even care about what happens to other people, and God says that he's going to require their blood at your hand, that's called blood guilt. And so the prophets had the responsibility of crying out and saying to God, or rather in God's name, here comes the enemy, you need to move. And so he's there on a wall, and it gives us a picture of what he is. He's a watchman, and that's why he says in verse 1, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart, watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am reproved. Now notice he's waiting to hear from the Lord, and he prepares his heart. And I want you to see this. He prepares his heart to receive what God is about to say. Now, he isn't wanting to successfully argue a case against God, but he wants God to clarify for him some information. I would hasten to add that questions are not wrong. Our response to the answers we receive is what is important. I don't believe that it's wrong to say, Lord, can you clarify something for me? I believe that the Lord is even open to me saying, God, you have to give me some light on this. I don't think I understand it. Can you please help me to understand what's going on? There's nothing wrong with asking a question. It's how you respond to the answer that's important. Years ago, some of you are old enough to remember this phrase. There used to be a bumper sticker, but it became a bumper sticker only because people were saying it. Do you remember the phrase, question authority? Some of you are old enough to remember that. Some of you have forgotten it so long ago. But that's what it was, question authority. I remember hearing a story of a professor who walked into his classroom, a college classroom, and one of his young students had... Uh, gone to the blackboard and had written those words in block letters, question authority. And that really was, a, was symptomatic of my generation. Question authority. And I remember hearing of the professor as he walked in and he saw these words, question authority on the blackboard. And he didn't answer, didn't say anything. He just read that and he walked up to the blackboard and he wrote underneath it, if authority answers, will you listen? There's nothing wrong with questioning authority, if you will. What right do you have to give me this order? But if authority answers properly, what is my response? So Habakkuk says, I'm asking of the Lord. I want to know why he's doing what he's doing. 
but I'm open to clarification and correction. That's what he means in verse 1 when he says, uh, and, and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am reproved. I'm not disputing or arguing with God. I'm submitted to him. I need his directions for my life. All I want is clarification. So I'm asking you, Lord, to soothe my troubled mind. I'm not trying to outthink you or out-argue you. I am just waiting for your answer. Because he realizes, of course, that God has all the answers. It reminds me of what Job 21, 22 says when we read, Can anyone teach God knowledge since he judges those on high? Who here has been his counselor? Who here has been his instructor? Who here has ever had God call you up and say, Listen, I got a problem and I need your wisdom right now. And that's the point. Isaiah 40, verse 13 asks the question, Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him? And so it's not that he thinks he's got something to inform the Lord about. He simply needs the Lord to inform something to him. Now notice in verse 2, he gets his answer. It says in verse 2, The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And so God now answers Habakkuk and gently begins to disclose to him his purposes. And there are three basic things you can see. One, he's instructed to write the vision. I want you to notice that. When he says to write the vision, that word vision, when he speaks of that, he's to write God's prophetic word to the people to communicate God's will to them. That's why he says write the vision. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no revelation or no vision, the people cast off restraint. So he's saying, I want you to write this down so that you can communicate this to the people. You're to write the vision. Now notice it's to be written on tablets. And the tablets that he says to write on are more likely, most likely stone. Now when he says this in write that, make it plain on tablets, uh, this would remind him and remind us that Moses received tablets with God's law on them. God actually gave to Moses some tablets initially when, when Moses was there meeting with the Lord. I find this interesting, and Marie and I were talking about this just a couple of days ago, my wife and I were talking about this, how that when Moses initially received the Ten Commandments, the Bible tells us that God gave him these tablets and he had written on those tablets with his finger. That's what the scripture says. He wrote with the finger of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10, it says, The Lord delivered to Moses two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken uh, to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the, in the day of the assembly. And so those tablets, when he says, write these on tablets, would speak of its importance, even as the commandments were important and God wrote. Even so, these tablets would remind them how, how, how important his word is. And, and an aside, just a very brief aside, I really shouldn't go here with you because it has nothing to do with Habakkuk, but I just feel like saying it. Um, Marie and I were speaking about this in a very practical way about the, the God writing uh, on our tablets, on the tablets of our heart now. When my Anna, who is now 19 years old, was a little girl in Sunday school in our fellowship, one of the little crafts that she she had was maybe when she was four or five years old was um, she made out of some soft clay a little heart you know and and all of us know those of us who have been you know we've been in school and we had clay that our teachers gave to us and we all have learned how to try and make little animals and things out of the clay all of us have done that I suppose and Anna had that as a you know something she did and what she did is she made a little heart it was pink clay, and she made a little heart, and she gave it to her daddy, and I still have it to this day in my office. I've got this little pink heart that Anna made me when she was about four or five years old. And Marie and I were speaking about that just the other day, and I said, you know, honey, because we were talking about this particular, this particular um, thought, you know, how God wrote on tablets of stone, because I said, you know, it's interesting. I've watched the movie, The Ten Commandments. How many of you have seen it? Most all of us? The Ten Commandments? I saw the movie, read the book. But as I, as I, as I was watching it, you know how in the movie you'll see fire come from the sky and then boom, you know, thou shalt not and all of that? Well, that's interesting, but that's not what the Bible says happened. 
The Bible doesn't say, and then fire came from the sky and wrote the words. It says that God wrote it with the, his own finger. And Marie and I were talking about that. And I said, it's amazing how we begin to interpret our Bibles by movies we've seen. I said, but, and we were talking about that because think about it for just a moment, that God wrote on stone. And Marie was saying, you know, that, that means that God had a little pressure that he put into that stone as he wrote the word. And I said, that's exactly right. We have hardened hearts. And the Lord presses his word into our lives. That's what he does. And even as my daughter Anna had that little clay, and initially the clay, as we all know, is very soft. But there are periods in our lives when you get older and your soft little heart gets hard. But even as she had written a little message on that clay, you know, though her heart at some points did become hardened as she grew older, the words that she wrote on that soft heart were still there to be seen. They're still there. Even if your heart becomes hard, those words are still pressed in. And I believe that God wants to write His word on the tablets of our hearts. And Ezekiel tells us that God will remove that heart of stone and will replace it with a heart of flesh. And God says, and I will write my word on your heart. And so that's to remind us that God wants to have a relationship with us and soften this hardness and imprint us with his word. And so when Moses received the word from God, he received it on tablets. And that tells us how important this word is to Habakkuk. He says, write it on tablets. And uh, also, it was to pro provide direction for the believer. When he says to us, and I want you to see this, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it, it's to provide direction for the believer. The message is to provide a road map for us as we serve God. That's the point that he's making. Psalm 119, verses one, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. And so God's word is supposed to be permanent so future generations can read it. It's to be plain or distinct so that all can understand it. And it's to provide direction for the believer so they can follow the Lord. Now in verse 3 continuing, he says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. God points out that the judgment Habakkuk asked God about was, was going to come on schedule. Now this has both a near future and a far future fulfillment. The near future would relate to the fact that the Babylonians are going to come and take the Jews into 70 years of captivity. Obviously, Habakkuk would be wondering how they're going to survive under such conditions. So God is saying that it will be made clear when it happens. In other words, at the end it will speak. And he's saying, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. And really the inference is, it will come at the right moment. God's timing is always perfect. So they're going to come and they're going to take you captive. They're going to be exiled to Babylon. And God's judgment on Israel is soon to take place. He's going to judge the nation for their sins. But the future application would, return to, would be referring to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see this by just looking ahead a little bit at verse 14. Because in verse 14 here in chapter 2, it gives you an insight in what God intends to do. I want you to notice in verse 14, he says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's not going to take place when Babylon comes and isolates or exiles the Jews. That will take place when Jesus rules and reigns. And so this alludes to the fact that Jesus will be returning. Now, how do we know that? If you're taking notes, Hebrews chapter 10 makes it clear for us. Because in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 38, the writer of Hebrews actually quotes this passage, but applies it to Jesus himself. Because in Hebrews chapter 10, in the New Testament, verse 35 reading to verse 38, he said, Do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So he applies this passage in Habakkuk to not just the Babylonian captivity, but to the future rule and reign of Jesus Christ. And so that has twofold application. Verse 4, 
is one of the most famous verses in the Old Testament. All of us has heard this, have heard this verse. Not the full verse, but the last portion. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The just shall live by his faith. The future plan of the Lord is that the earth will be filled with his glory, and God is going to bring judgment on Israel through the Babylonians. This is because he honors his word and must chasten the nation. But the ultimate fulfillment of the vision will occur at Jesus' return. In the meantime, the just of every generation shall live by their faith as they await seeing Jesus Christ. All of us know the very famous story of a man by the name of Martin Luther. All of us know his story. Martin Luther was a, a scholar, a Roman Catholic monk with tremendous intellect. And he was known during his day for being an especially devout monk. He had the opportunity of going to Rome. He actually had been living and serving in Germany. And for him, it was a great privilege and honor to be able to travel to, to Rome, to the seat of the Roman Catholic faith. And Martin Luther went and traveled to Rome. And when he went to Rome, according to his own writings and the historians who have chronicled his, his history, when he got there, he was absolutely overwhelmed by the debauchery of the city. He really had this idea that when he got to Rome, he would see the most exquisitely religious and holy city in the world. But he came back and he said, I've seen things that I, I can't imagine, I never imagined would be true and taking place there. He said where, where priests would actually feel themselves moral because they restricted their sexual involvement to women and not to other men. Now that was all the way back in the 1500s. And so when he came back, he was absolutely shattered by that. And so Martin Luther began to study through the scriptures and he was reading through the book of Romans. And as he got to the book of Romans, he read the scripture, the just shall live by faith. He said in his own uh, words, if, uh, if there were ever a, a, a monk who would be able to attain heaven through efforts of his own works, I was that man. He did everything he could to follow the rules and the laws of the church, to be a righteous and holy man. But the more he tried, the more he failed. And the greater he realized that there was really no way that he was going to ever be a righteous man, righteous enough to enter into the kingdom of God. And when that verse exploded from the page as he read it, the just shall live by faith, he said that he was set free. And that's why he went to the uh, church there in Wittenberg, Germany, and he had the thesis that he had uh, written up, and he placed it on the church doors. And the thesis that he had, the 93, I think it's the 93 thesis, as he went there and, and placed it on the church doors, that thesis was really a challenge to debate. That's what the thesis was. And as a, do a doctor of Scripture, what he said is, I have an argument that I would like to lodge with those who would defend the opposite view. And these are the things I want to argue with you about. And he wanted to argue with them concerning how a man gets into the kingdom of God. And he said, I'm not going to have, I can't back off from this. He says, I'm going to stand here. He said, by God's strength, here I stand. And so he stood on this one promise, the just shall live by his faith. That has been called the cry of the Reformation. Because people began to realize that a man or a woman is saved not by works of righteousness, which they do, but according to God's mercy, that God saves us. And that it's by grace that you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. And so he was the one who began to cry and remind the, the, the church world that you could not in any way, shape, or form ever earn the kingdom of God. You receive it as a gift. And so this verse here, the just shall live by his faith, is the cry of the Reformation. In verse 5, continuing, indeed, because he transgressed by wine, he's a proud man, and he does not stay at home. Because he enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied, he gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. As he begins to speak here in verse 5, if you take notes, you might want to note that he's speaking of Babylon here. The nation of Babylon is being pictured here. 
Babylon is, de is depicted with lust for war, and, and, uh, and he has an insatiable desire to conquer. I find it interesting to note that he says he enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. That's interesting because there's a proverb, Proverb 27, verse 20, that says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. So Babylon has an insatiable desire to conquer, and that's what he's referring to. Verses 6 through 8, continuing, Shall not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his? How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges? Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you? And you will become their booty? Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you. Because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. And so all the nations that have been vanquished and plundered by the insatiable, insatiable appetite of Babylon hate that nation. And that's what he's saying there. Because Babylon took their land and their possessions and they hate them for it. And eventually what they've done to others shall be done to them by the Medes and the Persians. That did take place in the history of, of Babylon. See, Babylon was a great and powerful nation. As a matter of fact, when you study the book of Daniel, Daniel makes it very clear that, da uh, that Babylon is the head of gold. It's the most powerful nation that this, uh, this world has ever seen, Babylon. And so Babylon ultimately is going to, have, uh, is going to be uh, dealt with. That's the point that he's making. Even though you've gone out and you've destroyed and you've stolen from so many, what that has done is it's caused the nations you've conquered to hate you. And they're going to rejoice when you're taken down. In verse 9, continuing, Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You have shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples, and sinned against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. You are guilty of taking land by force in order to build your world empire. You have a voracious greed as you have conquered and taken possession of properties. Like an eagle building its nest high in the mountains, unassailable, Babylon tried to build security by destroying nations and stealing its wealth. And God hates this. And by the way, in their insatiable desire to conquer, that falls under a category of covetousness. Of covetousness. And God hates that. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. His insatiable covetousness will be judged by God. We'll look at that in just a moment, and I'll bring it up to date. In verse 12 through 14, Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire and nations weary themselves in vain? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Babylon's method of gaining wealth was, in one word, warfare. Their nation was built through prisoners of war, brought back as slaves. And though the city would be incredibly beautiful, God's saying it's simply fuel for fire. The only thing that truly lasts is what is done for the glory of God. And what man builds without God will never last. And that's the point that he's making. But he goes on to say in verse 15, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. You're filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you, and utter shame will be on your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you, and the plunder of beasts which made them afraid, because of men's blood, and the violence of the land and the city, and of all who dwell in it. Well, I want you to notice in verse 15, he says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle even to make him drunk. Babylon is, the, what he's saying here is Babylon seduces other nations by their power and then invades them. That's what he means when he says that they are pressing their bottle to make him drunk. 
They're power drunk is what he's saying. And then when they are vulnerable, they basically enter in, they invade, and they destroy them. And so the application to this would be that drunkenness and sexual sin often go hand in hand. And I found that interesting as I was studying this. One of our commentators that I used was pointing this out. It's a picture really of seduction. It's a picture of seduction. It's a picture of Babylon saying, here, drink this. Here, drink a little bit more. Here, drink a little bit more. Until the, until the person that they're pressing the bottle into their hand is so drunk that Babylon now, as a seducer, can take advantage of them. And so the twofold application, one, is the fact that Babylon would use power to get people enticed, seduce them with promises, and then violate them. But the application, and by the way, I haven't even taken you here yet, yet, the application is there's various sins that God is speaking about here that apply not only in the physical but in the spiritual sense. For example, we already noted that covetousness was something that God hates. That was an overriding sin in Babylon. But that is still a sin that we find today in the United States. All I need to use is the word Enron, and people understand that. This nation understands that. You know, where you have people making millions of dollars ripping off the people who have, uh, who have invested in their company. When all the people are losing their money and all of their pension plans and everything else, the people apparently, at least it appears this way, we'll see whether this is true or not when everything's concluded, but it would seem that those who were running the show were making an awful lot of money and taking advantage of those who were losing all of their, all of their income. We see that all the time. That's something that is very typical. And so the rich and the powerful sometimes, unfortunately, will take advantage of those who, have, uh, who should really be protected rather than ripped off. And so you see that kind of thing in covetousness. You also see that kind of thing in the pressing of the bottle into somebody's hand. And, and the application, once again, is drunkenness and seduction go hand in hand. And very often we see that taking place too. And what he is saying to them is what you've done to others will be done to you. As you have shamed other nations, your own nakedness shall be exposed. Now moving on into verses 18 to 20, he continues and says, What profit is the image that its maker should carve it, the molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. Woe to him who says to wood, awake, to silent stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and in it there is no breath at all, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Now, Let's close with some practical application of this scripture. First, let me share with you what he's saying here in verses 18 through 20, and then we'll close with application. God is bringing a final judgment on Babylon's worthless idolatry. That's what he's bringing judgment on. He's simply saying, a piece of wood cannot deliver you. Isaiah said the same thing in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 5 and 7, where God says, To whom will you liken me? and make me equal, and compare me, that we should be alike. They lavish gold out of the bag, and weigh silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith, and he makes it a god. They prostrate themselves, yes, they worship. They bear it on the shoulder. They carry it, and set it in its place, and it stands. From its place it shall not move. Though one cries out to it, yet it cannot answer, nor save him out of his trouble." God made it very clear that you can go and you can cut down a tree. In Isaiah, you see this clearly. He says, the workman goes, cuts down a tree. He cuts up the tree into different portions. One portion of the wood he uses to, to, to start a fire and cook his meal. The other portion of the wood he overlays with some gold. He fastens it so it doesn't wobble and fall over. And he says, you are my God. He says, does this make sense? Uh, on the one hand, you're burning your God to eat. On the other hand, you're saying, save me, I'm in trouble. He says, it makes no sense at all. Now, it's interesting how the Lord, when he was speaking to the nation of Israel, especially keeping in mind its context, when God was delivering them from Egyptian captivity, when God was delivering the nation of Israel through Moses, remember he began to speak to them and he said, I'm the Lord your God and you should have no false gods before me. And God began to give what is called the two tablets of the law. In the, first four in the first four on the single tablet, the first tablet, it was man's duty to God. And then the last commandments relate to man's duty to man. 
And God says, I am exclusively to be worshipped by you. You are to serve no other God. You're to carve no images because I am the invisible God. And by the way, if you try and make an image of me, then in doing so you have reduced me from being what I am because I cannot be held to your dimensions that you're able to construct through an idol. Therefore, do not make an idol of anything in heaven or under the earth or in the earth, in the sea, in any way. Don't do that because you can't capture my fullness with your hands. But what is it that the children of Israel do almost from the beginning? We know that Moses is up there and he's receiving the commandments. And the children of Israel are saying, where's Moses? He's disappeared. He's probably dead. We better do something to protect us because we're out here in the wilderness by ourselves. And what happens if somebody comes after us? So Aaron, do us a favor. Make us a God that we can worship, a God that has delivered us. And what is it that Moses' brother Aaron does? He says, well, give me all of your gold. And so they give to him all the gold, and he fashions a golden calf. And then he says, Behold, O Israel, this is your God. And what do they do? They begin to rise up, and they dance in front of it, and they begin to party. And they're going through this great you know, revelry and all. And we've got Moses up in the hill, and he's with Joshua. And Moses hears the cry, and so Joshua says, It's the sound of war. And, and Moses says, That's not the sound of war that I hear. They're partying down there. And he comes on down and he walks up to his older brother and he says, what is this that you have done? He says, well, he says, the people gave to me their gold and I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. I mean, yes, right, you know, that's what happened. But from the beginning, they had these roots in idolatry and they wanted to fashion a God to follow. And God from the very beginning is saying, you can't capture me in a calf. You can't capture me in a totem. You can't capture me in a little statue. You can't do that because I'm beyond that. And anytime you, you do that, you're restricting me because I can be all places at one time. I am not restricted to that one thing. And by the way, when you fashion this God and worship this God and say you have delivered me, he said that is a great sin because that calf did not deliver you. I delivered you. And you're to worship me with all of your heart. You're not to form any kind of idol. You're not to bow down and worship it because I am the Lord your God and you cannot do that. But the nation of Israel did that habitually throughout its history. As you study your Old Testament, you see that over and over and over again, the children of Israel went after idols to the point where finally during the day of Jeremiah, during the time of Zechariah and so many others, and Zephaniah and the other prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, you see that the nation of Israel has gone once again into idolatry. It was their habitual sin. And they go back to it. And God once again through Habakkuk is saying, don't do this. Don't be doing this. Now, we in the 21st century would say, well, we're Christians and, and they don't do idolatry anymore. Well, some places, maybe Brazil or some other places, they might have some little totem in Alaska. And all, but we, we don't have that. And, and the problem is, is when God says you shall have no false gods before me, it's not always restricted to some statue that you might have in your house. Anything that takes me from God, anything, that, that captures my attention, my talent, my finances, captures it and takes me away from the Lord, the Bible says, is an idol because it has taken the rightful place of God in my life. Do you know that your relationships can even be an idol? Do you know that, that your children can be an idol? That your pursuit of education can be an idol? That, that your, even your car can become an idol. Your house can become an idol. There are so many things that can, can interrupt the flow of the Spirit in my life that I actually look at and say is more important to me than God Himself. And you say, well, that's for other people, that's not for me. But one of my favorite illustrations relating to this is when I was teaching a Bible study on one occasion and these two young girls were in the room and I noticed that, then, you know, maybe it was just boring for them. I, I, I guess it must have been. And as I was teaching the Bible study, they were just sitting there with this kind of dead look in their face. You know, there's just like, oh, when are you going to stop? And one thing about teenagers that I love is they're transparently honest. You know, we adults, we learn how to smile while we're thinking, man, I hope the roast isn't burning. You know, <laughs> what, the barbecue's over? You know, we, we can do that. 
But they just sit there like, oh, man. And I was watching them fascinated as I was teaching. And I continued the study and concluded it. And then there they are in the other room. And they're talking in an animated way. And they're smiling and laughing. And I'm thinking, something has captured their attention. Something has really excited them. Man, I wonder what that is. And I've told you this before. I walk up there and I'm pretending to get a glass of water because I want to know what these girls are so excited about. And lo and behold, they're talking about their boyfriends. Lo and behold, and I thought, you know, whatever you're really turned on by, whatever you're excited about, man, it shows in your face. It shows in the way you speak. You know what? Even your relationships can be an idol. And God says, but they can't save you. They can't save you. You know, as deeply as you might love your, your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, your children, whatever, your parents, as deeply as you love them, the bottom line is that we've all come to this point where we have realized as deeply as I love them, they cannot save me in my time of need. They can't. There's only one who can, and that's my God. And that's my God. And that's what he's speaking about here. He's saying, you have sins, various sins. You have the sin of covetousness. You have the sin of drunkenness. You have the sin of violence and warfare. You have the sin of idolatry. And as a result of that, God is saying, I am bringing judgment against you. The Bible makes it very clear that he's the one who loves. He's the one who saves. In Isaiah 46, verses 3 and 4, this is what the Lord says. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried from the womb. Even to your old age I am he. And even to gray hairs, I will carry you. Even when you're bald, I will carry you. He doesn't say that. That's my application. <laughs> I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and will deliver you. I carried you from the moment you were born. And I'll carry you when you're old. I'm the one who loves you. I'm the one who loves you. I was talking to uh, one of the young men in our church. We were speaking concerning his, his brother. His brother plays football now for Ontario Christian High School. Mike Callahan's son. We called him Mikey all of his life. But now it's Mike. You know, my name's not Mikey. My name's Mike. Yes, sir, Mike. But you want to know something? When Noreen Callahan and Mike came here, she had yet to give birth to Mikey. And Mike was born here. Little Mike was born while well, his daddy was serving in this church. I have known that little boy since he was born. And I've watched him grow from just this little guy in the nursery to a kid who's six foot two who's playing football now for OC. And I've watched that kid. And I've watched his dad. And I've watched his dad as he carried him as a baby. And I can tell you right now, if Mikey was playing out in the field and he got hurt, I can tell you right now that his dad would rush out there and pick him up and carry him off if he could. That's what fathers do. That's what fathers do. I can remember my son Joseph playing soccer and he got kicked, the ball uh, was kicked and it looked like it hit him square in the head. And he went flying and landed down on the ground like that. And I can remember watching him and my first impulse as a father was to run across the field and pick this kid up. I didn't do it. It would have embarrassed him terribly, but I wanted to. I can remember on one occasion he played third base on his little league team and this kid took a swing and hit the ball and, and it, it took a couple of bounces. It came in hard, hit Joseph right in the chest. I mean, it slammed him right in the chest. And I remember Joseph picking the ball up and throwing it to first base and, uh, and just standing there. And then finally the third out came and I was standing there by the dugout when my son came running off the field crying. He was hurt. The ball hurt him. And he buries his head in my chest and I held him like that. It didn't matter if anybody was watching or how embarrassed it might have been. A father needs to hold the child because the father loves the child. And that's what God is saying. He's saying, I love you. Those wooden idols that you've been pursuing, they can't carry you. They can't hold you when you're crying. They don't listen to you when you have a need. They won't deliver you when you're in pain. I will. Why? Because from the time you were a baby, I carried you. And when you're old, I'll continue to carry you because I love you. That's why. So why is it foolish to, to, to worship idols? Because they're wood and they're dead. And we serve a living God. That's why. And he says, and I will bring judgment. I will bring judgment on you because you have carved a God for yourself and that God cannot save. I am the God who saves and you need to turn to me.